Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio, with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to the Daily Red, your lunchtime catch-up on all things Liverpool FC. On a Wednesday, after Liverpool 4, Manchester United 0 at Anfield. Liverpool 4, Manchester United 0. Over two games, Liverpool 9, Manchester United 0. The most one-sided season of this historic rivalry. Liverpool were dominant last night. In the first half, Liverpool tore shreds of what might well be, no, not what might well be, what is the worst United team since the 70s. Their performance was an embarrassment, an absolute embarrassment. Liverpool were playing absolutely sensational stuff and United were walking around leaderless, rudderless, pointless football from those who travelled from Old Trafford and just scintillating stuff by Liverpool. Thiago Alcantara has and rightly will get so much credit for his performance last night. He was playing completely different sport to everybody else on the pitch. It was ridiculous. The gulf between him and everybody else was just obscene. But there are a couple of other players who deserve huge amounts of credit for last night. We'll start with Salah. Scores two goals. Looked lively from the off. Maybe the sight of Maguire playing as a left-sided centre-back got him in the mood. But Salah looked like Salah last night. Luis Diaz was outstanding, got a goal and an assist, never stopped working, caused United problems throughout, his touch, his control, his ability to always make the right decision. Sensational. Andy Robertson. When United had their good spell and managed their only shot on target, and seemed to be, if not becoming a factor in the game, at least settling into the game, at least making a bit of a go of things. It was Andy Robertson who decided to force the issue, who stepped out of the defensive line, intercepted the ball, carried it forward, fed Diaz, who fed Mane for the third goal. It was Andy Robertson who was unwilling to allow them any sort of foothold in the game. It was Andy Robertson who, when Virgil van Dijk had a sloppy moment, let him know that he'd had a sloppy moment. Let him know it was time to get his mind straight. It was Andy Robertson who went and took the ball from Hannibal Mejri for the fourth goal. It was Andy Robertson who, at 4-0 up, in stoppage time, was still sprinting around like a lunatic making sure that we forced home our advantage. And Sadio Mane. Now, I've said a number of times that I would be in favour of selling Sadio this summer because at 31 year left in his contract, I don't know that we can afford to give him a new contract long term alongside Mo on what I assume will be a contract for Bobby. Bobby, because I assume he won't want much of a pay rise. Bobby, because I assume he'll be happy to have a squad role. And Bobby, because we can run him into the ground over the next two to three years. And it's fine. Salah, because he's 
Salah, basically. And unfortunately for Mane, it was just that he was the odd man out. He was the one that had more value in the transfer market than Bobby Firmino. He's the one who's probably a little bit easier to replace than Bobby is because Bobby's such a unique one-of-one player. And he's easier to replace than Salah, who's, with respect, just on a different level. I would sell Salah, or sell Mane, rather, and bring in Nkunku, especially when we see the way Mane's playing now as a false nine. Nkunku is perfect for that role. However, however, last night is one of the best number nine performances I've seen by a Liverpool player. Like, that performance by Sadio is up there with some of the great Suarez performances from 13 14. He was just sensational. And watch his involvement in all four goals. So, for the first goal, he drops deep into our half to present a target for Jordan Henderson. Henderson finds him with the simple ball because Henderson is looking down the line. He's looking at the ball over the top and Sadio drops in and demands the ball. Henderson finds it. It's a good pass by Henderson. It's good movement by Sadio. He takes his touch and he turns. And by his movement, he's dragged Maguire into the deep waters where Maguire doesn't want to be. And then Sadio is just able to play the ball in behind. If Henderson plays the first time ball in behind, Maguire isn't that far, isn't that high, and United aren't as exposed. By Sadio dropping in and creating that extra man, Maguire has to shift with him. So Sadio, Sadio's movement and then his pass through create that first goal. Salah obviously finds Diaz, and Diaz taps home on five minutes. An absolutely outstanding goal by the Reds. His involvement in the second goal is even better. It's a wonderful flowing move by Liverpool. They move it left, they move it right, they move it back, they move it forward, they move it left again, they move it back again. Thiago finds Salah with a cross-field ball. Absolutely sumptuous pass. And we start our little pattern of play. Movement, one-touch football. Joel Matip decides it's time to go on an adventure. Steps in, plays it to Diaz. Diaz fires the ball back at him. It's not a great pass by Diaz. It's a lovely cushioned, controlled pass by Joel into Sadio. And Sadio just has an entire picture of where everybody is in his head and clips this perfect ball round the corner, over the shoulder of the defender, perfectly weighted onto Salah's right foot, one-touch control, and the finish. It's stunning football. It's absolutely stunning football. And James Milner's reaction on the bench just told the story. That pass, every time you watch that goal, that pass gets better. And I'm not exaggerating. Watch that pass 10 times. And I guarantee you, after the 10th one, you think it's better than you did after the first one. If Harry Kane had played that pass, that would have been... Five to seven minutes of punditry at halftime, just on that pass. Nothing else, just that pass. His body movement, the angle, the weight of the pass, the vision, just the perfect little touch. Oh, it is phenomenal stuff, folks. Phenomenal stuff. Then watch him for the third goal. As Robbo breaks and Diaz goes left, Sadio's making a run through the middle. Maguire knows he's there. Maguire's backing up, trying to keep an eye on him. Sadio goes one side. Maguire turns his head. Sadio goes the other side. Maguire turns back. Sadio fakes the run in at the front post, in towards the six-yard box. Maguire bites on it, Sadio sags back. He's now created two to three yards of space for himself. Diaz's ball is perfect. 
And all Sadio does is redirect the power. He doesn't try to put anything into it. He just redirects the power that Diaz has put on it. And he places the ball in the bottom corner from 15 yards out. It's a sensational finish. But it's the movement before that that makes the goal. It's his movement that sends Maguire well away from him. Now, the fourth goal, there's two schools of thought here. We can take the opportunity to laugh at Harry Maguire, who is looking across the defensive line, can clearly see that Victor Lindelof is deeper than him. And as Jota goes to play the pass, he steps out. We can take the opportunity to laugh at Harry Maguire, but I would say take the opportunity to look at Sadio and look at his movement again. He's making a break through the middle as Andy Robertson wins the ball back and it go, it breaks to Jota. Sadio could easily make a full sprint between Maguire and Lindelof and make himself the option for the pass. But his awareness is such that he knows Salah's going to make a run. So he fenced the run, then he drops back, makes himself a passing option for Jota, and Maguire again bites on that and steps towards him. As he steps towards him, Salah's in behind, simple ball by Jota, really well executed, but a simple ball, and Salah's in and Salah scores. Now these things don't get talked about with Sadio his movement his intelligence rarely gets talked about one fella told me last night Sadio couldn't have known where Salah was because he didn't turn his head well first of all Sadio took his picture when Robbo won the ball back he knew where everybody was secondly he has ears he can hear so when Salah starts to make his run and screams at Jota, Sadio hears it and thinks, okay, I'll make myself the passing option here. I'm the simple ball. If it comes to me, I can go round the corner past Maguire anyway on the first time pass and mows in on that one either. But Sadio last night, he wasn't Thiago level because nobody was, but Sadio was the next best thing. He got an awful lot of credit for his performance at Wembley at the weekend, and rightly so. But last night, he was far better than he was at Wembley. Now, it was against United. It was against Harry Maguire. And and we can laugh at them and point out that they're awful. And it's all true. They are garbage. But the little things Sadio did last night, it was like Sadio did a Bobby impression, but with Sadio's skill set. And if that's the player he can be for the next three years, then I think you give him the contract. I think unless the numbers just don't work, I think you might want to give him the contract. Now, I love Nkunku. I think he is sensational. And I think he would be the final piece of refreshing the front line. And I suppose you can look at it that Nkunku is six years younger than Sadio. Right now, I would say they're of a of a similar level. But Sadio is going to decline further. He's not... He's had a physical decline. From a technical level, he's the same player. He doesn't have that explosive burst anymore. But he's becoming a more intelligent player. But what I would say is, I think if you go and get in Kunku, you get a player who will give you seven years of what Sadio is giving you at the minute. And Sadio can maybe give you three. It's just a matter of what the numbers are. Sadio is already ingrained in the system. Sadio already knows what's expected. The players know Sadio's game. So there's familiarity there. Any transfer is a gamble. It just depends on whether you take the short-term view or the long-term view. In the short term, 
Sadio's probably going to be the better one for us because he won't have any kind of settling in period, adaptation to a new league, anything like that. Sadio is going to be able to play his game. And Koku has to transfer his game from the Bundesliga, from Leipzig, into Liverpool's team. And that's something that will take time. There's no wrong answer. There's probably no right answer. Either one moving forward for the next couple of years would be great. I like the idea of Nkunku with Diaz and Jota and whoever else comes along for the next seven, eight years. But I also like the idea of the current five for the next three years, and then we see what happens after that. Either way, people need to stop treating this Liverpool team like some sort of flash in the pan, like some sort of fluke, because we've been great now, not great for three years, 18, 19, 19, 20, and this year. Last year, injuries. We still finished third. There was a time when all of us would have sacrificed family members for a third place finish. You remember those years under Sunes, some of the years under Roy Evans, some of the years under Julier, the last year under Rafa, Kenny's years, Hodgson's time, most of the time under Rogers. We'd all have taken third in a heartbeat. So in truth, you could say we've been great for four years. It's just that we lost a year because of injuries. We'll be great again next year. And the year after that. And the year after that. We've got the best goalkeeper in the world. He's signed long term. We've got the best centre back in the world. He's signed long term. I know he's 30, but look at what Thiago Silva's doing. Thiago Silva... At the very peak of his career, wasn't nearly as good as Virgil is. He's been able to extend his career to 37. Virgil can't play like this till 35. Of course he can. We've got Ibu, who's a, an absolute monster already. We've got the best right back in the world, signed long term, likely our future captain. We've got one of the best left, back, left backs in the world, signed long term. We've got a very good backup to him, signed for three more years after this. We've got one of the best holding midfielders in the world, signed long term. We've got another two years of Thiago. Again, you look at Luka Modric, who's 36. Thiago can't do that. Thiago's every bit the player Luka Modric is, every single bit of it. Front five or the front five. We've got Harvey, Fabio Carvalho is coming this summer. Curtis Jones still has a lot of potential. This team is not going away. Naby Keita is 27. He's going to be, I assume, signed long-term this summer. He's only really starting to get the plane in the air as well. He's been in with all manner of problems for the last couple of years until this year. You know, he had like a damaged rotator. He had, you know, a flat tire. His landing gear wouldn't work. The windscreen wipers on the plane wouldn't work, whatever. But this year he's got the plane up in the air. He's only going to get better. There'll be players arriving this summer as well. So the idea that we should enjoy this while it lasts, yeah, you should, of course, but you also shouldn't just sit there and expect that it's all going to be over in a couple of years. Now, I think Klopp will extend. I know he's got two years left. I know he said, you know, at the, at the minute, nothing's changed. Key words in that are at the minute. Why would he walk away from this? It was one thing to walk away from Dortmund, who were beginning to decline, 
had sold his best players routinely. And truth be told, we're never likely to contend with Bayern long term because the financial gulf there is just ridiculous. Now, I know the financial gulf between us and City is fairly stark. But Dortmund, I think when Klopp took over, I want to say they had the sixth highest wage bill in the Bundesliga and like the seventh highest turnover or the seventh highest profit for the year, something like that. They weren't making the type of money that we make. We make as much as United do. We're not as reckless in our spending. But we're pretty close to United. There's not a massive gap there. We don't have the wealth of Abramovich, but we're now a more wealthy club than Chelsea are going to be, regardless of who buys them. We've got more wealth than Arsenal. We've got more wealth than, than Tottenham. It's only really City, and we've proven we can match them. We've proven for four years now we can match them. We basically had to write off last season. And across a 40-year span, they've taken one point more than us. Actually, in truth, we've taken two points more than them now, though we have played one game more. Ball back in their court now tonight. But this team, it's not close to the end. This team is getting better. And will improve. It will improve. So, yes, enjoy it. But forget this while it lasts thing, lads and lassies, because we're the best run club in Europe. We've got best in class in every position throughout our structure. Now, Julian Ward has big shoes to fill with Michael Edwards' departure, but he's been schooled by Michael Edwards. And he's got his own connections and his own contacts and he'll have his own ideas, but he'll still have the support of a world-class recruitment department and a world-class analytics department. So the ability to find players, that's not going to diminish. And let's just say we have a good summer this summer, bring in that starting midfielder we need and a backup to Trent. Maybe we get a couple more Kate Gordons and Bobby Clarks as well to safeguard the future. And then next summer we go and we get Jude Bellingham. Is Klopp really going to walk away? Is he really going to walk away from a 20-year-old Jude Bellingham? Really? I don't see it. I don't see him walking away in 2024. I think he stays till 2026. He may even stay longer. Fergie never planned to stay as long. Wenger never planned to stay as long. I don't think he stays as long as either of them. But I certainly think he'll go 10 years or more. What's important is to convince him to stay. You do that by making as much noise as you can and showing him there's nowhere he'd rather be. Same thing goes to the players. Saw Salah's comments last night. Thiago was talking up the atmosphere last night. Salah just said, wait for the derby. Show them all on Saturday. No, Sunday. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.